So this is a really important topic, I think. This is the relationship between food, health, medicine, and nutrition. Uh, and it's a subject that does not get enough attention when we talk about health issues. And we have some great panelists here, which I'll introduce. But I couldn't help but start, because so often people, you know, you say, well, what should I eat? And the, and the information's confusing. And we, two weeks ago, we found out that maybe a chicken isn't as good for you as we thought it was, uh, you know, and, it's, and red meat isn't as bad as we thought it was, and vice versa. And I'm reminded some of you may have seen the movie When Harry Met Sally. And you met, remember that famous line, Rob Reiner's mother plays the part. She's sitting next to Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal at the Carnegie Deli in New York, and Meg Ryan is getting very, I should have brought Dr. Ruth in to tell this story, but Meg Ryan, <laughs> Meg Ryan is getting very excited and, and simulating a sexual experience, and Rob Reiner's mother says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> and that line always got me in terms of what, what we should eat. It shouldn't be a corned beef sandwich, at least not today. But there's also the African proverb, which is, your food is supposed to be your medicine, and your medicine is supposed to be your food. And uh, in our healthcare system, I'm not sure that that is a basic principle that's followed everywhere. So I'm first going to introduce uh, our dean of the School of Nutrition uh, at Tufts University, a cardiologist, one of the nation's leaders in nutrition, and that's Dr. Darius Mazafarian, who has, has written uh, hundreds of articles on this subject about food, health, nutrition, and medicine. And uh, from Darius, then, we're going to go to Victoria Mazes. Victoria is the head of the Center for Excellence at the, at the Arizona University, the Center for Integrative Medicine. She's also world-renowned in this area of trying to ensure that medical providers provide a thorough, holistic, and balanced curriculum, and that the public understands the various things that's supposed to go into you as you eat. And then finally, we're privileged to have Isabel Camariza. Isabel is from Kigali, Rwanda, <coughs> and has been very involved in this issue of how solid food and good food helps people dramatically when they're hospitalized, particularly people who are underprivileged, underserved, or underfed. So we'll go from the domestic to the global. But first, I want to talk, ask our dean uh, to tell us a little bit about what are the, what are the gaps here? What, what do we know or what should we know or what don't we know about the relationship between health, food, nutrition, longevity, and just living a full life? What, what's missing from this discussion? Why aren't more people talking about this? Um, so uh, thanks, Dan, for you know moderating this, and thanks to the uh, Aspen Institute for in inviting me to speak and for everybody for coming. Um, I'll start with a few things that we know, and then and then some things that that we don't know. Um, you know what we know is that nutrition is the single leading cause of poor health in our country and globally. So this is the single modifiable factor that influences our health, influences healthcare costs, influences longevity, influences well-being. And so think about that. The number one cause of poor health is ignored by the healthcare system, right? That explains most of the problems that we're facing. Um, the other thing that's not directly related to health, but is very, very in, uh, important for health, is that food and agriculture is the number one issue for sustainability on the planet, whether it's water use or land use or climate change emissions or stress to the oceans. Um, and then if you put those two things together, the number one issue for health, the number one issue for sustainability, this is the number one economic issue on the planet. There are trillions of dollars being wasted, both in human health and planetary resources, that could be leveraged for good. And this is an economic imperative. We spend one in five dollars in our entire economy on healthcare right now. For per family, we spend $32,000 per year on healthcare in this country, right? That explains all of the, the challenges we have in income stagnation and, and communities being, being left behind. So when you put together health, you know, uh, sustainability and the economy, this is the single greatest opportunity of our time. And I think the 21st century is the century to fix food and agriculture because we have to. Otherwise, we're gonna swallow up our budgets with healthcare expenses and we're actually starting to live shorter, less healthy lives for the first time in uh, you know, a thousand years. Um, so, so that's something that we know that this is a great crisis. We, we also know, as I mentioned, that, that there's such key touch points that are missing to take care of this problem. I mentioned healthcare. The electronic health record doesn't have nutrition in it, right? So the number one cause of poor health 
is not addressed in the electronic health record. Medical training, I'm a cardiologist, I went through years and years of medical training, and our, some of our other panelists will talk about this. Medical, there's no nutrition in medical training. There's four hours of voluntary training in four years of medical school. Many medical schools don't even do that, that four hours. Um, the National Institutes of Health, this is an incredibly powerful, wonderful organization that drives research in our country. The National Institutes of Health, supposed to be focused on health, doesn't have a National Institute of Nutrition, right? Shouldn't the National Institute of Health have an institute focused on the number one cause of poor health, giving real strategy and direction so we can push this field forward? So those are just some, some of the gaps. Um, and, and again, we throw numbers around. We throw billions and millions and trillions around. It's really hard to put it in perspective. Just one number to, to, to remember and put in perspective, the federal government alone spends $160 billion per year on direct medical expenditures for type 2 diabetes. Just the federal government, just type 2 diabetes, $160 billion a year. The entire Department of Education is $80 billion a year. The entire CDC, $15 billion a year. The FDA, $10 billion a year. The NIH, $35 billion a year. Just what the government's spending on type 2 diabetes is more than all of that put together. So we are drowning in diet-related illness that is entirely preventable with, with better diet. So now, what, what do we know and not know about what to eat? That's you know, what really people often want to know for, for personal reasons, of course. I think we've learned a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. And, and people always ask me, why is the science changing so rapidly? And the, really, the short answer is that it's a very new science. We haven't um, been studying uh, you know, rigorously nutrition and chronic diseases um, f for more than, let's say, 30 or 40 years. It's really since the 80s that we started studying nutrition and chronic diseases. And what we've learned in the last 30 or 40 years, especially the last 20 years, is that we need to move away from a reductionist single nutrient focus where we pick nutrient X or nutrient Y or nutrient Z and read it on the back of the package and say, yes, that's good for me, or yes, that's bad for me, so this food is, is good or bad for me. It's really about the whole package. It's really about the whole package of what's in food. And what we've learned is that the most important foods for us um, are what I call foods that give rise to life, foods that you can plant in the ground and in the harshest of conditions will nurture a young plant life to life. That's what our bodies need with aging. And so beans, nuts, seeds, fruits, whole grains, and vegetables, most vegetables are actually fruits, um, eggplant, pumpkin, avocado, olives, tomatoes, cucumbers, right? All of these are foods that give rise to life. That, these have thousands and thousands of nurturing phytochemicals and flavanols that are incredibly important for, for our bodies. That's the, the number one uh, lesson for things that are good for us. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's probably kind of neutral, and, and neutral's okay. We can't always be eating what's good for us. We need some variety, we need some other things. And, in that category, I would put things like milk, eggs, chicken, butter, um, probably unprocessed red meats, although maybe a little bit of harm for diabetes. That's kind of neutral. And then the worst stuff in the food supply is refined starch and sugar and all the hyper-processed and packaged foods. And there's a lot of focus on added sugar now. So added sugar has become an area of focus. But there's five times more starch in the food supply than added sugar in foods if you take out soda. Um, and so I really emphasize starch. Starch is 100% glucose. And so when you eat cornflakes, when you eat a piece of white bread, when you eat a plain white potato, you're eating 100% glucose. So just remember that, that it's a treat. It's just like eating Skittles. You can have Skittles for breakfast or cornflakes for breakfast or Special K for breakfast. It's identical, right? And instead, we should be eating yogurt and fruit and nuts and, and, and really healthy foods. So that's kind of what we know. Um, but I think there's so much we don't know, and I'll just end with, with, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, but how many people here eat dairy like cheese or yogurt and milk and think it's good for us? Okay. How many people think dairy is you know, bad and toxic and people should be avoiding dairy? Right. <laughs> yeah. How many people are lactose intolerant? Good question. So, so the crazy thing is that I actually don't know which of you is right, right? For a category as big as dairy, 15% of calories in the food supply. For most of our modern guidelines, we've just been basing the guidelines on reductionist theories about how much calcium we need and how much vitamin D we need and how much fat we should avoid, leading to the recommendations to eat three servings of dairy to get enough calcium, as though dairy is just a vehicle for calcium and nothing else. When what we're learning now is you know, cheese is fermented and then fermentation process creates really interesting compounds like menoquinones, 
which may improve diabetes. Cheese may reduce risk of diabetes. There's, there's something called milk fat globule membrane in dairy, which may reduce cholesterol. What do we do with milk fat globule membrane right now? We throw it away in buttermilk. Buttermilk is, is mostly enriched milk fat globule membrane. We mostly throw it away, feed it to the animals. There was a, a nice trial just presented that people that got natural milk fat globule membrane had their cholesterol lowered by 10%. Imagine you eat cheese and your cholesterol goes down 10%. The, the, the yogurt and the microbiome. <laughs> yogurt and the microbiome. So there's so much we need to learn about yeah. brain health, the microbiome. And so I think we need a new moonshot, a new moonshot to focus on nutrition in this country. Research, integration into medical school, integration into healthcare, integration into healthy work sites, healthy schools. And, and within 10 or 20 years, we can really turn these challenges so around. So this is the 11th big idea we didn't hear <laughs> yesterday. Now, that's the perfect segue to Victoria, OK? Because Victoria is at the University of Arizona. They have this amazing Center for Integrative Medicine. Many of you have heard of Dr. Andrew Weil, who is world famous, talks about this holistic approach to medicine and health. So I thought you might talk a little bit about what you're doing there and how, how, you, how you're dealing with a lot of the issues that the dean just talked about. Yeah, it really is a perfect segue, so thank you. Um, you know, I have been at the University of Arizona for 19 years, and I teach, and I do research, and I see patients. And I would say that um, when I see someone for an integrative medicine consult, often the most important change that they make that improves their health is a change in their diet. And you just described what we know up to date about the principles of healthy diet and healthy nutrition. And we've all learned about the Mediterranean diet and the enormous body of research that supports that from a public health perspective. But I'll tell you, when I sit across from an individual I actually need to individualize my recommendations. And I need to do that by asking them questions. So I need to know, for example, have they been on lots of antibiotics, which is going to change their microbiome? Um, do they have symptoms? Do they have brain fog or a lot of bloating or skin rashes? Because that's going to change my recommendations. And so I'm really sitting across and trying to understand who they are and the specifics of the issues that they face so that I could make better recommendations. And I get lots of questions, like, is soy safe if you've had breast cancer? Yes, it is. Um, what can I do to lose weight? That's a really, really common question. Of course, we want to know what they've tried to date. And they want to know about keto diet and paleo diet and all of the other latest fad diets that are getting lots and lots of media attention. But when I sit with someone, I recommend a lot of elimination diets. Anyone tried an elimination diet? You know, that would be where you eliminate dairy, as an example, and see, do you feel better? What, what do you notice? You got to do it for at least three weeks. Um, who's tried intermittent fasting? You know, that's a really interesting body of science that's being, it's, it's early, it's really early. But, you know, we have some evidence that it may reduce your risk of a recurrence of breast cancer if you do a 13-hour overnight fast. It certainly looks like it resets the immune system. It may reduce the risk of going from prediabetes to diabetes. We need more research. A lot of it's on rats as opposed to humans, but there is a growing amount of human research. I always talk to people about reducing their environmental chemical exposure and also their processed food consumption. So this is part of what we train doctors in um, as integrative medicine doctors. Because as you said, um, although officially 25 hours are required in medical school, it is the rare medical school that teaches 25 hours and usually what they do teach is very biochemistry focused. You're a cardiologist, heart disease, number one killer in the United States. How much do cardiologists have to study nutrition? Not at all. We have a pediatric obesity epidemic. How much nutrition do pediatricians have to study? Zero, nothing. You know, we just haven't made this part of the requirement. So our center is addressing this gap. We have a fellowship that we started in 2000. We've trained 1,900 physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. They're all over the country, to some extent all over the world. And we include 70 hours of nutrition education. We have a new program that's called Integrative Medicine in Residency. It started in 2008, so I guess it's not so new. But we're now at 86 residencies worldwide, and we have about 20 hours of nutrition in that 200-hour curriculum. So that the 
physician can actually answer their patient's questions about is butter good for me or bad for me, which is, comes up a lot. You know, it used to be we recommended margarine. We don't do that anymore. And I'll tell you that around the country, there are more and more medical schools who are embracing culinary medicine. So we're actually training physicians how to cook uh, so that hopefully they will be able to be role models and also educators for the patients that they see. We've had an annual nutrition conference for 15 years. We've trained about 8,000 people through that. And we have online nutrition modules. We've trained about 30,000 health professionals through those. So we're developing these scalable ways to address nutrition that changes that ridiculous gap that you've already heard about. And now we're shifting our attention to really move to the public. Because where does the public go for nutrition information? The internet, of course. And what does the internet have? It has influencers. And how much nutrition education have those influencers had? You know, it, it varies, perhaps. <laughs> but you're not necessarily getting great education. And it's hard to discern what is good and what is garbage. Uh, and we are considered a trusted source. So we have a new uh, app that we've developed, seven domains of wellness, not just nutrition, but also movement, relationships, resiliency, environmental exposures, spirituality, and sleep. And we're testing that in underserved communities. It's at a fifth grade reading level, and in English and Spanish. So we're trying to democratize wellness. So it's not just for the affluent. And we also are developing our, our first toolkit. It'll be for people who have been diagnosed with cancer. And one of the folks, I, again, will be nutrition integrative approaches if you have a new diagnosis of cancer. So that's a little bit of what we're doing and more during the Q&A. Thank you. So, so I'm delighted you mentioned uh, nurse practitioners, allied health professionals yes. who are such a major factor, yes. not just the physicians, but the other people in the mix. And also the internet, because the marketing and advertising of food, mm -hmm. uh, even in traditional media, tends to be very calorie dense processed right. foods. Uh, we don't advertise a lot of blueberries or strawberries on television. No, yes. we don't. And you know, there was an amazing study that was just published. Uh, Kevin Hall, he's an NIH researcher, and he actually did the research, mo most of you I'm sure saw it, about the biggest loser, how most of the people who were in that uh, television program regained their weight. Uh, so he just did this study where he hospitalized people at the NIH because they wanted to actually follow every single morsel that people ate. 20 people, men and women, they spent four weeks in-house at the NIH. And they were presented, they were their own control. So for two weeks they got an ultra-processed food diet, and for two weeks they got a whole food diet. And during, same amount of calories presented, during the time where they got the ultra-processed food, they ate 500 calories more, and they all gained weight. Whole food, they ate less. So their hormones responded to the food that they ate, and they were healthier on the whole food diet. It's a more costly diet, but that's where we need to go. So this is uh, amazing. It, the principles are applicable not only at home, but globally as well. But I want to talk about this issue as mm -hmm. it relates to globally, because it's where 85% of the people live. It's where uh, problems of poverty and hunger and malnutrition, overnutrition, exist even in, in, in greater amounts. And we're pleased to have Isabel here, who's president of Solid Africa, which is an NGO. Uh, this is a, a, a fascinating person who has come back to Rwanda, works in the healthcare system, largely involved in the feeding of people uh, in the hospital setting, in the healthcare setting, and why they do it, what she's found in terms of when people are fed in, in Africa, for the most part, the families bring the food to the patient in the hospital. They're not served hospital food. So I wonder you talk a little bit about your experience about this issue of health, nutrition in Africa, and, and also as it relates to uh, uh, the patients that you're dealing with. Yes, thank you, Dan, and thank you for everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to really focus in Rwanda, because that's the country that I'm really comfortable in. And so the issue that we have is really access to food. More than just access to nutritious food, is access first to food. So patients come to hospital and rely on families to bring them food on a daily basis. Now imagine the setting when you are in a city far from your home. It becomes difficult for the family to come and bring you the food. Now what do you do? So most of the mothers, fathers, caregivers, will go in the neighboring shops and buy a donut that 
maybe cost 10 cents, 5 cents, and feed the patient. So they will eat sodas and donuts for two days, three days going on. So when we started 10 years ago, um, for me it was eye-opening. So I was born in Rwanda, uh, but went studying in Belgium, and then I came back, and I never realized as a young um, woman the issue of the food in hospitals. For me it was, you know, you are sick, your family bring you good food, and then you are okay. But this is not how it is, it is happening. So we are now feeding 400 people on a daily basis, and to tell you the truth, it's almost nothing. We have people queuing. We have people that we put on a list. We have kids where you have to say, no milk for you because you are not the most, I would say, in an emergency of that. Uh, so, but the more we grew uh, in feeding patients, we realized that, okay, now that we are giving food, maybe we should give good food and good nutrition, and that's how we embarked in farming ourselves. So we are now farming 80% of what we deliver, we control the value chain, the value chain, use organic pesticide, uh, organic, organic fer fertilizer to be able to make sure that the food that we are provide for, for our patients are the, have the most nutri nutrient for them. But also teaching them how to cook when they're back to their homes. Because if I feed you for one month and you go back to your home and you end up eating the way you were eating, because in Rwanda the issue was we had food available, but people were malnourished because people were always eating the same thing. I would eat my sweet potato and my beans. If I farm vegetable, I would sell the vegetable because vegetables were more expensive. So I would not eat vegetables, I would not give vegetables to my kids, but I would just eat my sweet potato and my beans. So it, it's also a, just a shift in the mindset of telling people this is what you need to eat to get better. We've seen so many cases um, of people getting better. You have a child that has severe malaria that nobody can stay in a hospital for three, three weeks, but because he's not well fed, will end up in a hospital for four months. So it costs more to the healthcare system not to feed the patient uh, than actually feeding the patient. So we are doing preliminary studies uh, with the University of Global Health Equity to be able now to quantify in money how much it costs to the healthcare system not to feed a patient. But also to make studies on how long it takes for a patient that is well fed compared to a patient that is not well fed to get better if they have the same illness. Our preliminary findings is that we can find somebody that in 30, you, we get better 30 days earlier than somebody that is not well fed. Well fed. Um, so really we think that, not we think, we believe that food is medicine and food heals. But also, as we only work in hospitals, the idea will be to teach those people before coming to the hospitals that they already have that, uh, that way of just eating well, knowing what to eat. And to tell you the truth, in Rwanda, we don't have a lot of fast food. I think we only have one fast food. Mm -hmm. And people, except maybe for rich middle class, will go in that fast food. But people really are used to eat healthy food. We are not used to processed food, to chips, to whatever you have here. Uh, <laughs> and, but, but still, even with that, we still need to educate people. And even with that, we still need patients to be conscious that they need to eat healthy food. That's one of the, 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 the aspects. But the other aspect that we have found is that, you know when you are sick, you don't want to eat. Your body doesn't feel good, you don't want to eat. So there's also the fact of just having comfort food, having the food that you want, the food that you feel will make you happy. Uh, when I started back in 2012, um, I met a patient, and he was, yeah, he was almost dying. And his last wish was a grilled meat. So it was like 9 p.m., we went look for the meat, and he only sucked the meat. He didn't eat the meat because he didn't even have the strength. So I was looking at him and said, so that was all? That was all that you wanted? And he said, yes, now I'm in peace because that taste, I've been thinking about it for weeks. But I didn't have the money to go and buy that meat. So food is not only for you to get better. It's also for you to comfort. And the other thing is also imagine being sick and not knowing if you're going to eat. Being sick and not knowing, would I have two meals, three meals today? So when we started, we used to see patients that would have a plate, always a plate with them. And 
<clears throat> it took me maybe one month to realize. And at some point I said, but what do you always have a plate with you? In the morning, in the evening, you always carry a plate. Mm -hmm. uh, and that patient told me, because I never know where the food is coming from. Because you will see churches, university students coming in the hospital, but once in a while, they will don't know the hours, they will not know how many people they will feed. So they wanted just to be ready, saying if they say in pediatric ward, there's food, I want to be the first running. But then I imagine, okay, that guy have the, at least he has the strength of going and run and be on the queue. How about somebody that is in bed, don't have a caregiver, don't have somebody to run for them, what do they do? Uh, so yeah, so I think our work is just food security uh, in hospitals for people just to have that peace that you gotta eat. Uh, and then just to, to give them that comfort of, we will try our best to provide the food that you need the most and also uh, good food for you to get better quicker, go back to your community and also be able to teach other members of your family on how to eat healthy because Rwandan, we are lazy. We are not a food culture. Uh, even if you ask a Rwandan what is the national dish, they will say, oh, because we are not into food that much. So what we used to do is that you take one pot and you put everything. You put potato, you put whatever, and you overcook everything because you have put the beans and the potato at the same time and the vegetable bowls. So by the time you eat, there's, no, there's nothing in your food because it has eaten for three hours, four hours. It's also to teach people, you know, if you start with the beans, first the beans, then go with the potato, even if you said it's a lot of glucose, but we still, <laughs> no, but not potatoes, and slowly maybe uh, we'll be moving and changing our diet, but uh, this is the work that we are doing in Solid Africa, and I know that Rwanda is not the only country in Africa. We share the same issue, as you said, with Congo, Burundi, Uganda, even in Morocco, you find that countries that are developed in big cities they feed the patient, but when you go in rural area, they rely on the families, which is not sustainable, because those are the people that are already struggling to eat when, they in the, in their, when they're already in their homes. Now to ask their family to come on a daily basis, feed them, it's just asking too much. And I've seen that in Kigali, you can have somebody being sick. So the first week, the family will come every day. By the time he spent two months, they come every two days, every three days, because it's heavy on them, uh, to come on a daily basis and feed the So a lot of these problems are, are global. Even you mentioned even the problem issues of Rwanda, but education and, and not cooking well and and access. I mean, th these are actually global problems. Obviously, they're much more acute in the developing world th than they are in the United States, but they're real. Uh, so I want to ask a question. See if you can respond fairly quickly. If if you were king, uh, queen, uh, uh, emperor, empress, whatever, and you were in the United States government, what, what would be the one or two things that you would do to try to help facilitate this problem? So right now, government provides a lot of money for research. Uh, government provides uh, guidelines, dietary guidelines on a five-year basis, the food guide pyramid, my plate, they provide school meals. Uh, you know, there are a whole sort of things that the government provides, but the problem steam, seems to persist. So what would be the one or two things that you would think could be helpful to move this fo problem forward? It does not just have to be the government, because obviously it's the private sector and the schools and everybody else, but if you are looking at it from a, a government perspective, let's start with you, Dean. Well, well, so I think there are three solutions. There's Clear always three. To yeah, <laughs> three, three <laughs> solutions. It's, it's policy, innovation in the private sector, and culture change. Those are the three things we need to do. And, and I'm not going to speculate on sort of theoretical things. I'm going to say what's actually happening. Um, there's real movement here. And, it, and at Tufts, we have a public impact initiative to go to policymakers, give them the best evidence, and we've actually started to make a difference. There's a food as medicine working group in the US House now that we helped catalyze last year. Um, there's major changes to the Farm Bill, other things. So just a you know, short list. I mean, there's no silver bullet. So it won't be one or two things. So I'll say 10 things or 12 things quickly, but very quickly. So, so we need to get you know, better, much better research. We're not spending nearly enough on research. At the pace we're going, we're discovering things, but it'll take us 40 or 50 years to, to know what we need to know. We need to shorten that to five or 10 years. We need a National Institute of Nutrition at NIH. Um, in, in healthcare, and we need to give incentives to private companies to do R&D for healthier products. In healthcare, we need nutrition and electronic health record. 
We need fruit and vegetable prescriptions so your doctor can write a prescription and uh, insurance will pay for it. And the Farm Bill has a $25 million pilot the federal government is paying to test this. They're interested in this. So if it works in five years, Medicare and Medicaid may pay for healthy food. We need medically tailored meals, which is actually three meals a day for the sickest patients. That saves money, very similar to what you're describing, but three meals a day at home. California is doing a $6 million pilot to test medically tailored meals. It's happening. And to change education, both for medicine, medical students and, and nurses, we need to just change the tests. If we change the US medical licensing exam, the board exams, um, that every physician has to take and every nurse has to take their specialty exams will change medical education overnight. We need to have changes to work sites. We need to give tax incentives to work sites that do the right thing and have you know, robust changes to their, to their uh, uh, environments um, and uh, to, to improve healthier foods. And we definitely need to improve schools. School lunches are actually pretty good. School lunches are actually the best meal of the day for most kids in our country. School lunches have improved a lot since the 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. But there's much, much more we can do. We need school breakfast. There, there's many, many other things we, we can do. And then we need some changes in the dietary guidelines and labeling at FDA. But to me, that's, that's much, much less important than the, the other categories. Victoria. So I'm going to be much more concrete. Yeah. Uh, the federal government in the United States uh, subsidizes the most unhealthy food crops, uh, soybeans and corn. And therefore, those are the You're cheap. About farm programs, largely. Yes, yes, and therefore, those are what are inexpensive for people who. As Secretary of Agriculture, I had nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> uh, so why don't we subsidize, subsidize vegetables and fruits? That would make such an enormous difference for uh, the population being able to afford to buy vegetables vegetables and fruits and eat them. And secondly, since you asked for two, I really believe we have to feed organic to pregnant women and to young children. We have to remove the environmental chemicals that have to be part of what is triggering the epidemics we're seeing of unhealthy children. Uh, when I was first in practice uh, as a physician in the 1980s, it was rare to see a child with chronic disease. And we have so many children now with chronic diseases. One of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons are these environmental toxins that they take in in their food. And we need to be feeding organic. OK, all right. Do you have any thoughts before we go to questions? Yes. Uh, OK, go uh, ahead. I'll go with policy, because us, we just need to put food as part of the medical care. But I think also for people just to realize and invest in that. Because but now that I've learned that even in your country, nutrition is overlooked when it comes to health. <laughs> uh, it's for people when they invest to health, you know, I can give you the best doctor in the world, the best drugs in the world. If you don't eat well, you won't heal well and you won't heal quickly. So I think it's just for people when they invest in health, in global health, to take nutrition as a big component of whatever they're doing. I, I would say that several of the, the Gates Foundation is one who has actually taken a very big interest globally in this. Okay, question. So uh, we're gonna I'm do my best and I may do two or three in a row. Just we'll take this gentleman up here and then we'll go to this side. If you, if you wanna state your name, fine, and try to keep your question without sure. giving the history of your life, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no history here. Uh, these chronic illnesses among children is very serious. The statistics are unbelievable. What are we doing with the franchises like McDonald's, Taco Bell? Do you hear any initiatives in playing harder ball with them? Because you see advertising, all the sports from, programs from my, that in you, you see where minorities love these sports programs, all the advertising is for Whoppers and, and really pet. Yeah. What's the... Yeah. Uh, I think it's an enormous issue. A few years ago, the American Academy of Family Physicians had Coke as a sponsor. And there was this uproar. It's like, how can this be? How can we be accepting money from Coca-Cola when they are clearly part of the problem? And I don't know how they're going to become part of the solution. Um, because processed food is part of the problem. And so even as they move to slightly healthier food, if there are additives, if there are industrial oils, if or there are the flavorants and the colorings, then it's still going to ultimately be an unhealthy food. And so I, I don't have a good answer. I agree it's a big problem. You want to comment quickly? Yeah, and then go? I, I agree with that. And I would just add that I think, you know, very briefly, food industry is not tobacco at the end of the day. The tobacco we want to put out of business Food industry is very heterogeneous. There's lots of innovation going on. Millennials, in particular, are driving innovation towards health and trust and transparency. 
all the big brands are declining in sales, and all the growth in sales is in young, innovative brands. Um, and just the two canaries in the coal mine are Kraft Heinz and Beyond Meat. So Kraft Heinz, if you didn't see it, is almost out of business because they were bought by 3G in Brazil. They said, we're not going to innovate. We're not going to change our products. We're going to sell what we have at the, and maximize profit. They're, they had a 70%, you know, 80% drop in their stock this year, a $15 billion write-off. Beyond Meat, which I'm not going to say is healthier, maybe more sustainable, but at least has the aura of health and sustainability. Um, you know, has $30 million in sales, it's a tiny company, it has no profits, and it has a market cap of $5 billion, right? So, so, so in, insane, right? So that's, that's the future, and, and food industry gets this, and, and I, I have to say that demand has to be part of the solution. McDonald's puts salads on the menu, they don't sell. So, so I think demand has, so culture change and demand has to be part of the solution, and that's why government has to play a role to level the playing field and reward companies who are trying to do the right thing. If companies try to introduce a healthier product and it doesn't sell, the CEO gets canned if they're a public company, right? That's, that's so they're, they're really stuck. And so I think that government has to be part of the solution and food industry will respond because millennials are driving, driving and, and everybody, but especially millennials are driving, driving the show. Okay, yeah. there was a, let's see, this lady right, well, let, wherever you're closest, go ahead, right here. If you could, yeah, stand so we can. <coughs> My name is Dr. Bailo Bai from Sierra Leone. Um, so in doing the Ebola outbreak, we found out that like um, people from families who are food insecure are ten, 10 times more likely to die than people who are from families that are food secure. But that's not my question, and that's just, my question is in Sierra Leone, as you said, is the same thing, there is no I'm a doctor from Sierra Leone, and I received no nutrition training, zero hours of nutrition training during medical school. And like many clinicians are not even able to, to like advise patients on nutrition okay. and, and, and what they need to eat and all, all those things. So I don't know, I want to start something like that in Sierra Leone in my university. So I'm asking you to like, how would I get your contact and get um, help from you, like to get can curriculum you help and all those things. And, and she can yeah. help. One, one of you can help him. Uh. <laughs> well, one of the tools that we have are we have online modules that are uh, accessible anywhere in the world that are about the nutrition and the anti-inflammatory diet, which is a form of the Mediterranean diet, uh, nutrition and cardiovascular health, nutrition and cancer. And you would have to look at them and tell me if they were a good fit in Sierra so Leone. I'd to love him. to talk to you. Can you talk to him afterwards, yeah. giving him your online information? Mm -hmm. and yes. I think it's one interest. Pardon? Is. What is what is the uh, what's your email? What's what's the what's the, website? What's the, the best way <laughs> to get you? My want, my email and is. And will you tell me what to eat yeah. tomorrow night? Yeah. Too, yeah. <laughs> Um, my email is listed um, on the attendee, or, but if you look at our website, which is the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, if you just Google that, you will find us. Yes. Yeah. I do think it's an interesting point about uh, uh, the whole list, take your medicine with food, yeah. uh, and obviously good food, but it's uh, got to be part of the health care. And the Ebola issue is those who did survive, which is too few, were people who are in better health, generally. That was... Uh, True. Okay. And, and see, can I, Dan, can I just add quickly? Yeah, this ahead. is a global problem. The rates of type two diabetes in India exceed the United States, but per, the percentage, let alone the people. So mm -hmm. this, and in Japan too. This is not a U.S. problem. I mean, this is. And a is this problem. because their diets are changing? Yes. More yeah. like more like Western diets, or, or what? Well, you know, many fewer people working, you know, long hours in the field, and much much worse diets. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Got this gentleman right here. I'm trying to go both sides of the room if possible. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you. So, if you were designing the perfect diet for health, would it be a one size fits all that vegan or vegetarian would be better than uh, a diet that was uh, void of most sugars and uh, <clears throat> starches? Um, and how, how does meat and chicken fit into that? Okay, who wants to take that? I'll, I'll, I'll start quickly. So I, I think that you know, people who tend to, tend to be vegan and vegetarian tend to eat minimally processed, bioactive rich foods, but veganism and vegetarianism as defined doesn't guarantee a healthy diet. So fries and a Coke are vegetarian, Oreos are vegetarian, right? So, so um, you know, most of the problems in the food supply are vegetarian actually. So I think that vegetarianism per se, and I, I know many people who've tried to go vegetarian and they feel worse and they gain weight because they're eating rice cakes and other things. So, 
So I think really, the, the, to me, there is a big picture population diet that's good for everybody. Um, and then there's going to be individual variation within that, that big, big camp. But the, you know, the big picture you know, diet for everybody, is, as we've talked about, is minimally processed foods that are bioactive rich. If you can add fish, I think that's pretty important for omega-3s. Maybe not totally essential, but hard to get the omega-3s. If you can add yogurt, pretty important for the probiotics. There's other ways to get probiotics. Um, that's really what we, we need to be eating. And of course, there may be, depending on your disease state, certain things people need to do. But you know, there's not going to be 70,000 different diets that are completely different for, for the world. I mean, we r roughly, our biology, you know, it, it supports that, that type of a diet. But, but the personalization will come, but I don't think the evidence is quite there yet to do it. So, you know, we don't need to eat animal products. You could have a perfectly healthy vegetarian diet, but it would be hard. But on the other hand, if you have, you know, poultry and fish and, you know, one, one serving of unprocessed red meat per week, you know, that's not bad for your health by, by any means, yeah. Okay. You want to, either of you want to comment further or not? Well, I agree with what you said. Um, you know, one of the questions is, what did your mother eat when she was pregnant with you? And even that influences how you develop and some of what your needs are going to be. Uh, how many antibiotics did you get? Do you have any particular chronic diseases? Uh, for example, uh, blueberries, one of the um, foods that have been shown to help prevent Alzheimer's. So, you know, it'd be all good if we all ate a lot of blueberries. Uh, fish. Do we have any more left? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fish clearly has lots of benefits. It is the best source of omega-3 fatty acids, but you don't have to eat fish to be healthy. So I think it, it does depend, and I agree, there are Dorito vegetarians, and they're not doing a very good job. And vegans, <laughs> vegans need to do some supplementing, because, for example, B12 doesn't come from a vegan diet. So there can be uh, some micronutrient deficiencies when you eat a vegan diet that you have to pay attention to. But, but wouldn't you like the federal government to spend just a billion dollars a year on research to answer this, your question? Yes. They're spending $160 billion on type 2 diabetes. Let's add a paltry billion dollar a year National Institute of Nutrition to, so we can answer your question in five uh, years. I would just, yeah. uh, a little advertising for this because yeah. this is... Uh, uh, Darius's idea, and I actually support it. Uh, we do a very, we do some research on nutrition, mostly through the Department of Agriculture from the federal government, okay. and it's pretty good. But it's not comprehensive, and it's it's poorly funded, to be honest okay. with you. And NIH, they used to do a lot more than they do now. A lot of it's in the endocrinology, diabetes area, but uh, it's not cross fertilization. Okay. So this is a really important idea that okay. he has. Let's see. There was this lady right up front here. Let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll get, you, I'll get you next. The middle is always tough in this world, po politically and everywhere else. So we're going to go to you next, okay? Hello, Claudia Diaz, Mexico City. If I were the queen of Mexico, because we already have a king, uh, what I would like to know is how to get rid of the soft drink industry and the junk food, because poor people in Mexico associate f those foods with being rich. So when you have cash transfer programs that go to small towns in rural areas, there's a Coca-Cola truck and then there's a the money, and then the children tell the mother, mom, we're rich, we now have our grant, whatever, let's go buy Coke. So the, 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 the penetration that the soft drink industry and the junk food industry has had in Mexico is just, we are, I mean, we have many epidemics, but one of them is childhood obesity yeah, and, yeah. of course, soft drinks and Doritos. I'm just curious, is this a, a big problem in the developing world? Are you seeing more and more of uh, uh, high-calorie, dense foods come in as, yes. as incomes improve? Yes, uh, I think in many countries, maybe not yet in Rwanda, but it's coming. But, and at least Coca-Cola is everywhere. So <laughs> when you're happy, you drink a Coke. When you have a party, you drink a Coke. So. I think that the thing is really to educate people, and because media has filled us with, you know, that happy moment of Coca-Cola, that happy moment of eating a hamburger, then you have that in your mind that, you know, if you have money, that's the thing I'm going to eat. And also, I think the fact that it's easy, sometimes cheaper, then you don't have to cook, <laughs> and yeah. your kids are happy. So I think really it's a change of mindset in, edu in educating people. I would have to say that the soft drink industry, a lot of them have begun to see their business model is very directly challenged. And they're moving to other product lines, including waters and flavored waters, and they're buying other products. Now, I don't know how 
deep down this goes, but these are smart people. They want their companies to last for a long time, and so this has got to be part of their thinking as well. Yeah, I, I was going to say that I, I, you know, I said earlier that big food's not big tobacco, but soda is the closest analogy to big tobacco. It's not necessary. It only causes harm, and it's all the tactics and advertising and everything are very similar. So that's the one area where really strong policy is good. There's now 16, 17 major big countries around the world that have passed soda taxes. Um, I think soda taxes are a good idea, but I think all of the money should be used for subsidies for healthier food, not for other, not just to go to the government coffers. Um, and I think taxes for junk food, as Mexico has passed, are also a good idea. But that's not going to eliminate the problem overnight. It, but it's but it's a sign that government has a role. I uh, was really influenced by a book by the Heath brothers called Switch, uh, in which they described. Um, how you could help people make behavior change, whether on an individual level, a community level, or a whole country uh, level. And uh, one of the examples they gave uh, was in Brazil, where people used to have many, many children. And all sorts of uh, public health messages about contraception essentially failed. And then there was a really, really popular soap opera. And in the soap opera, the couple had two children. And that apparently caused more influence to reduce the number of children people had in a family than anything else. And so I think we have to be creative about how we're getting our public health messages out there. And we shouldn't uh, ignore the influence of celebrities and influencers and, and see how they can potentially help shift the culture so that doing the healthy thing is seen as fun and desirable and cool and the way to be in the world. This is a Malcolm Gladwell yeah. issue that you just gave. Last question, this gentleman right here, because we're going to zero, zero time, but the folks will stay here for more nuance. I'm Alice Rueza from Uganda. I work on conservation. So I'm curious, we are finding in Uganda more and more that the people who live near forests have much better nutrition rates mm -hmm. than the people who, than people who have abandoned agricultural land. And this is in line with the, some of the things you mentioned, like fruits and nuts. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, are you making those connections with the Department of Forestry and uh, nutrition? I, I mean, one of the uh, amazing things is that for the vast majority of countries in the world, there's no national surveys on what people are actually eating. And so in the United States, we have the N National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which updates every year, and we have national data. China has this, Canada has this, many countries in Europe have this. Most of that information is not public, except for in the United States, so researchers can't access it. But in most countries, they don't have this information. So, so actually understanding what people are eating around the world has been just a lot of hand-waving. Um, we have a project funded by the Gates Foundation called the Global Dietary Database, where we're, we've collated now um, almost uh, 1,500 surveys from around the world, mostly national. And now we're trying to assess this. And so we'll look into this and see if, uh, as we're you know, getting this research done, um, if there are relationships between where people live in countries and, and health. But, you know, again, amazingly, like you'd think I should be able to answer that question, and there's just no data. So it's really, um, a, really a wonderful question. Yeah. yeah, Victoria? There was a really interesting study that uh, showed that when people know their local plants, roots, they're able to incorporate them into their cooking, and they get a lot of the micronutrients. And so I'm not surprised to hear that. But the other thing I would think about is, this is a session on nutrition. Nutrition is critically important to our health. So is spending time outdoors. So is having vistas, so that we have inspiration from nature. We evolved in nature. We do well seeing blue skies and, and green. And so is managing our stress, which being near a forest is going to help you. There's a whole literature growing about forest bathing, when we walk amongst trees and what happens to us. Obviously, we have less environmental chemical exposure, because the trees are part of what produce the uh, healthier environment. And so there's so many reasons that living near forests could be helpful besides just the nutrition difference. So uh, one of the fastest growing parts of American agriculture, farmers markets. We now have about 14,000 in this country. 20 years ago, we had less than 2,000. And when the citizens, whether they're in urban or suburban or rural areas, meet the people who actually produce their food, it creates a contact point. And in many cases, they'll buy more nutritious foods that way uh, than they would otherwise. And, and our schools, as you said, are doing a better job. Michelle Obama should be commended for what she's done. And I think it's made a big difference. Um, so uh, it's, it's really a comprehensive problem. You know, it's, I think it was 
John Maynard Keynes once said, there is, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. <laughs> and so this is, on the other hand, there are some basic truths that these folks have all talked about here. So let's, I think this has been a very productive conversation. Let's give them a hand, okay?